All right, good morning, everybody. Um, I guess quite a lot of the people in the room probably know who I am, but um, I shall just give you a, a little intro about me before we start. Um, probably not quite as long as the one Nigel gave, but um, I shall keep it uh, short and sweet. Uh, I'm Chris Evans. I've been working in the IT industry about 27 years. Started off in the mainframe side of things. Um, pretty much always storage. Um, and now doing um, dedicated consultancy work. And you can find me on Twitter. You can find me blogging. Um, or you can actually find me through my own website. So, um, quite interestingly, um, Nigel and I didn't confer before we started doing the presentations, and I thought we'd start not doing a history lesson and going back and looking at stuff, and actually thinking about it. Um, that's exactly what you did, Nigel. So you've done that part of it. I don't have to do it. Um, so rather than go back and look, look at what we've done in the past and talk about storage from you know, how it used to work and all the rest of it. I thought we wouldn't do that, and we wouldn't look at the lovely guy from IBM and his, uh, his, the original IBM drive, and we'd actually jump forward into the future and actually talk about what we want storage to be rather than storage as it was. So, so what do we want storage to be in the future? Well, it could look like that. It could be holographic storage, and it could be all in nice little tubes, and we could just lift out our data and put it in a machine but I doubt that's going to happen. Certainly holographic storage hasn't worked, and I don't think we really use it en masse these days. It could look like that, and it could be in your head, which, again, I doubt it is, um, Johnny Mnemonic style. And in fact, I looked up the details of this, and he actually only had 80 gigabytes in his head. That's what they thought they were gonna, we were going to carry around 20 years ago, 80 gigabytes. There was an upgrade, and I think it was some sort of compression technology, and you could get it up to 160, but effectively, that's, that's all he carried around. And he had to have a jack on the back of his head that they plugged it into to get the data in and out. And you think, today, we've got wireless cards, we've got cards that will take hundreds of gigabytes, so they were miles off in their idea about what we th they thought we would have in the future. Um, we could have data that looks like this, and we have to a certain degree in the cloud. We, um, for those of you under the age of about 40, I guess, in the room, the one on the left is uh, on the table anyway, at least. That is ORAC from Blake 7. And that was the device that could actually hook into any computer anywhere. So that was basically something that could hack the internet, as we would look at it today. And it had access to every single database in the world, and it could do anything. And it was also a bit stuffy and a bit miserable, which was quite good, too. Um, the thing on the right is the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the book which we you know, look at it today, and that's pretty much Wikipedia. Um, and you know, we've got access to all the information in the world. So we, you know, looking, looking at the future, actually, we're pretty much there already. Um, or you could do this with your future storage. <laughs> and, you could, and you could take a box. And it may not be obvious until I actually put the arrow on there. But those are actually beer taps. So this actually is, um, this is from Pure Storage's office in, um, in uh, California. And they've, they have many different EMC boxes they've collected over the years as they've replaced technology. And they convert them into beer, beer fridges, and all sorts of other things, which is quite fun. So actually, let's, um, let's get a bit more serious now and talk about what we actually want storage to be in the future. And I thought I'd put down a list of what I thought I'd want storage to be. Um, and it'll be good to see whether people, this resonates with people, and we'll talk a bit through some of the details. So the sort of things I think really we would want going forward are Features like quality of service. You know, we want to be able to actually uh, control the, the data that's going backwards and forwards in our systems. And we're very much today based on the idea of doing what I would call the McDonald's method of delivering storage. You walk into McDonald's and they just give you something and they want to get rid of you out the door. There's no quality in that like going to a restaurant where you would get seated and served and you would get the response time at the time you expect. And we still deliver I.O. back to the host on most systems, not everybody's. Um, without quality of service using that McDonald's method. And it's, it's, not, a good, it's not a good solution. Um, we want things like pain-free migration and transformation. You know, we don't put a box in and have to sit there every three years and spend masses of, uh, of money moving that data and moving it elsewhere. And how can we fix that problem? Because that one's a really expensive issue. Um, and Len touched on it earlier, I think, just talking about that whole process of moving from one box to another. That migration process is a real pain because unless you've got a good way of measuring what you're going from and to, you can find that you underestimate, overestimate, and it causes a real problem um, uh, to production workloads. We'd want things to be ultra-efficient. Why wouldn't we? Um, we'd want it to be automatically managed and nice and simple to configure. Why wouldn't we? Um, we'd want it based on policy rather than based on hard method methods like you know, the number of disk drives, number of LUNs, um, on a, on a system and, and you know the sort of the old style carving up. We want it to be based on things and policy that 
describes things like protection levels and uh, you know, um, resiliency and so on. And to a certain degree, I guess we'd want it to be hardware agnostic. We want to not have to worry too much about what the hardware is that's underneath there, and that's where the software-defined stuff comes in. Um, we'd, I would imagine, want it protocol uh, agnostic, because we know, you know, there's, there's all sorts of protocols we talk about today, and we really don't want to be stuck in having to wonder whether we're putting a fiber channel or, or Ethernet and NICE, in all those different things. And, and finally, I guess, the one thing we want is we want it to be low cost. Cost seems to be one of the biggest things. Now, um, just to touch on that, um, I had an interesting chat with a company called Infinidat, and they're a company that came from um, a, a bunch, of, bunch of people who did the XIV product and then originally did Symmetrics. Um, and they um, surveyed their customers, and in order, this is what they found. They found that customers had um, pain points around cost, being the most important one to them, uh, reliability and operational complexity, and I, I guess if you scale and you're a big organization, that's a big issue, all the way down to the, the most irrelevant ones being floor space and power, power consumption. And to be honest, I would imagine most people would probably resonate with that. And the reason for, I think, the bottom two being at the bottom is that um, a lot of the time, those two things aren't managed by the storage people or the storage teams. Somebody else looks after the environmentals and, they don't have, and the storage team don't pay, so they don't care. So, so technically, what do we want out of our storage? Well, I'd imagine we want it to scale. We want to be able to say we can get hundreds of petabytes worth of capacity in a system, and we want it to be able to be geographically distributed, potentially. So scale is one thing. Um, we want it to be fast a lot of the times. So we want performance out of this stuff, because as workloads increase, we want to be able to get the speed out of it. We certainly want diversity. We want to be able to, to deliver different protocols, different data types, different application types, especially if we were putting it on one shared storage infrastructure like we do today. Um, and potentially, we want the flexibility there. So we want to be able to manage all of those things and still have it deliver to every single instance and every single application. Um, so scale, what do we mean by scale? Well, people are going towards exabyte scale um, environments, and petabyte scale probably isn't that com uncommon anymore. I know, Martin, you used to have on your Twitter, um, Twitter handle, you used to say you managed two and a half petabytes of storage? Yeah. How many did you manage today? Somebody in 40 and 50, and that's in, in what? That, I mean, and that must be what, in over a four or five year growth? Uh, yeah. So two and a half to 50 in, in such a short space of time. So not surprisingly, people are dealing with huge, huge volumes of data. Um, we're getting lots of new different data types. We're getting unstructured data. We're getting uh, machine generated data. Um, and, and clearly people are, are following something called big data where we're just keeping all of this stuff because we think of the future somehow in the future, this is going to have some sort of value. And we might be able to mine it and get something useful out of it. So we, we want it to scale. Good example here, just touching on, um, I mean, Martin's uh, uh, just given us a good example, but I asked um, DDN, Data Direct, um, to give me an example. And they, one of their customers is Oak Ridge, um, Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the US. They've got one environment alone, which they've got 40 petabytes worth of capacity on one, one environment. Um, and that's not in common you know, to have many, many multi petabyte uh, environments out there. So, um, speed. We've got an issue because as, we, as we've, um, as Nigel alluded to that lovely setup that he had earlier where you had those two boxes and the, the, the lovely screen, um, the systems we run today are much, much faster and hard drives have not kept up with that. And storage has become, surprise, surprise, the bottleneck in the, the infrastructure. Um, and as a result, we're seeing storage and compute coming closer together. And we've got, um, where's Hans? Hans is going to talk about hyperconverged stuff this afternoon, where that stuff's being brought together to fix the fact that storage and compute need to come closer together to improve performance. So speed is an issue for people. And I think you know, we need things to be fast. As an example, um, if we look at the, the increase in, in power of, the, of CPUs over the last 20, 20 30 years, um, and this is, by the way, this is... Um, this is our logarithmic graph. Um, we see a logarithmic growth in performance um, of CPUs, and it, is, it grows massively, but, but hard drives haven't kept up with that, sadly. I'll try that again. There we go. Um, one other thing just to look at in terms of speed is, um, and I, I can see that Alex is in the back of the room, and I, haven't, I don't think this has got the NetApp um, figure on Alex. But um, performance in, in systems is, is incredibly fast these days. So this is... Um, in, this is a, the SPC1 figures in terms of IOPS. And you look at the speed of the systems that run now, 
um, yet that are delivering incredible performance at really, really low response times. So storage devices have really had to speed up because this is what customers need. Now, we don't all need 10 million IOPS, perhaps. You know, we might need a lot of IOPS, but we certainly um, perhaps don't need 10 million. And where's my data coming from? Well, we're seeing data coming from lots of different places. Um, unstructured data that's coming into the environment, media. Martin deals with a huge amount of media, but, you know, um, I think Hans has probably taken about 3,000 photographs so far. Um, <laughs> and, and that's a great example of stuff that just gets uploaded into social media. Um, um, and we end up storing a huge amount of data that um, perhaps is duplicate, but we just have an awful lot of it. But then the more serious uses are things like medical x-ray, satellite imagery, geographical data. You know, there's a huge amount of that being generated. Um, and really, to be honest, a small amount now is the OLTP stuff, the stuff that we would traditionally know like the Oracle databases. Um, and finally, diversity. Just, we, had, we just have data coming from everywhere, and we, we're just growing at an exponential rate. And really, you know, that's, that's a big, de big deal for us. Um, one final thing, and then we'll move on very quickly, because um, I'm not sure how much time I have, Enrico. How many? 20. 20 minutes. Wow. OK. That's pretty good. 20 left. That's good. Yeah, OK. thought I'd less than that, but that's fine. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I shall. I shall slow it back quite a bit. No, 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 I've, I've, that's all right. That's okay. I've got, lo I've got loads of slides. Don't worry. Um, so from a flexibility perspective, obviously, the sort of things that we're looking to achieve would be getting rid of problems like the noisy neighbor, the I.O. blender, which is a bit of an issue for virtualization where we've got very much a random workload. Um, but, you know, at the same time, we want multiple access profiles to be able to put various different data types on here. And we've, all, we've got all of those multiple use cases we've already just discussed. And... I think there's a really interesting one that's at the bottom there that I've thrown on just, just for interest, and, and that's to break this purchasing cycle we seem to have to go through where we seem to have to buy stuff every three to four years and do massive replacements of our technology. And that's just such a wasteful um, thing to do. And there are, you know, there are ways that vendors, including vendors in the room here actually, which we might get to, are actually working out how to fix that. I had to have one slide with containers in, Nigel. Mm -hmm. but it's, but it's, but it's in there for you. And I, 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 I balance that by me having the one that says mainframe so that we're all, we're all fair then. Um, but, you know, you, you look at it now, and we're trying to support a huge number of different platforms. So um, there's still bare metal servers, Nigel, which I still love. There's nothing wrong with bare metal servers. Um, obviously, there's hypervisors, um, and there's multi-hypervisors coming along. We're putting stuff on containers, although the storage support for containers is a bit, issue, a bit of an issue at this stage. Um, We've still got mainframe around. People still put stuff on mainframe. There's still a requirement for that. Um, and we've got things like OpenStack coming along, which are changing the dynamics of how we put our storage out there. There's, you know, and, and, that, and then you know, below all of that, we have to worry about all the different connectivity here. And again, Len touched on it a minute ago about how their product supports all those different features. But people are still, still heavy into fiber channel, yet there's still lots of other ways that we're connecting into these systems. So there's a huge amount of complexity in, in the platform support we have to do. So what are we seeing in the industry? What are the major things, themes that we're seeing happen? I've divided it into three or four things because I think these are the major things we're seeing uh, occurring. And it'll be interesting to see whether everybody agrees with me or whether you think um, I'm barking up the wrong tree. But the first one, I think, is divergence. And we used to have one platform. We'd stick all our data on it. Most of that data was OLTP. It was all connected to our big Oracle databases. We've, much, we've very much gone away from that. Um, and we're diversifying, and we're seeing lots and lots of separate platforms for different, tech, different requirements. So we're seeing platforms being built for things like big data. We're seeing object stores. We obviously have the separation of NFS and block type systems, scale-out NAS solutions. And I think we've seen that, that divergence of technology. On the other side, and again, this goes back to something Hans will talk about later, so I won't do too much in it we've actually converged, and we've actually brought things back together. So we've got both divergence and convergence going on at the same time, where we've moved, moved, merged things back in together. And of course, as a technology, we've just gone all in for Flash. We just, Flash just seems to be the thing that everybody wants to talk about, gets all the noise, gets everybody's attention. Um, and I'd, I'd ask the question with all of those, you know, um, should we be, should be going commodity or should we be going custom? Is the array actually dead? And I think that, <laughs> do you think that's a contentious question, Nigel? Once again, yeah. 
it perhaps is. It perhaps is one for the end. And I, I, I don't know whether you know, that's necessarily true or not. It, it's a, it's a good, good discussion point. So when we say divergence, what do we mean? And I tried to come up with a categorization for all the different types of storage that we put out there. Um, we have hybrid, commodity, and by commodity we mean just do it yourself with you know, but maybe a bit of software. That sort of fits into some of the open source stuff, but we get open source products. There's app and data aware products now. There's smart storage that's a bit more intelligent about handles, how it handles the data. Uh, object store, scale out now, scale out SAN, all flash, software defined. Um, huge number, and I put on a number of different companies just to give you an idea of the, sort of the companies that are actually working in these spaces. There's a huge number of different types of platform. So what, why have we gone down the divergence route? Why has this happened? Well, I think the idea of a general purpose array is just going away. We just, we've, we've gone down the route of things for a specific purpose. Um, we've got vendors who are targeting certain things, maybe certain data types or certain techniques to improve performance or to deliver the, the features they want to deliver their, in their products. Um, and a lot of these are becoming data aware. So, you know, at a, at a high level, you've got things like, say, Tintree, who are focusing on the, the virtual machine and encapsulating the, the object of the virtual machine. Um, and then you've got other um, companies like Data Gravity who are focusing on the actual data, or primary data, who are doing similar things. Talk about that in a minute. Whoops. What did I press there? Did I? <gasps> wow, well spotted, Nigel, thank you. <laughs> it is a bit, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so convergence, what's the, you know, what's the score with convergence? Um, I won't take too much away from Hans's thunder later on because he's doing that, that whole, uh, a whole talk on it, but I'll, I'll at least have put a slide up, Hans, and talk about it. Um, convergence is really sort of the idea of moving um, storage and compute closer together, and uh, the effect of that is that it removes dedicated storage appliances from the data center. Um, the idea is to integrate them together so that they're a bit closer and you get high performance, but obviously a lot of the, the what I'd say smarts or the intelligence is in the software at that point. So um, that gives us potentially easier management, especially in smaller environments where there's not dedicated storage teams, um, possibly lower cost, possibly more flexibility, and better capex opex. And a, a measure of the sort of companies out there are the ones that are listed up there. There's about there's four major companies that are doing appliances, and there's lots and lots of other people who are doing it software defined. Flash. So um, Flash is a great, a great subject because it seems to have become uh, a, a story in its own right, and I think it's, it's definitely the, the, the target for replacement of hard drives. But you know, it, it's not going to solve all your problems, and it, it's not the solution at this stage for every single problem. Um, it does fix the performance gap. It is high, high in I/O density, um, and we are seeing some very interesting new form factors. So, um, I'm not sure which one of those two on that side is the M2 format. I think it's the smaller one, but these are the things that are going into laptops today, um, and they're tiny, but they're you know they're still as as performing as solid state drives. It's, it doesn't take long to think that those sort of things might end up in servers. And, and in servers in their thousands, a bit like um, some of this, the flash vendors have done today. And if we do that, we could have some incredibly high density devices that um, could, could deliver um, flash at a very economic rate. The only problem with flash, of course, is that there are issues with it. It does wear out. Um, you, need a good, you need good controllers to control the flash and actually make it work effectively. Um, and, if, and as a result, we've seen lots of um, vendors develop arrays specifically for that because you can't just drop in a flash drive in, in the replacement of an HDD. Just how much of an issue do you think the limited lifetime is? Is it an overhyped issue? <clears throat> right, so um, I've got a slide that I'll come on to in a minute, but which shows the SLC, MLC, TLC. Um, I think initially the lifetime story was absolutely true, but vendors have done a massive job in terms of their controller architectures, the software, their ability to understand the actual um, physics of what goes on at that level to be able to fix those problems. So lifetime now, you know, you would expect a product easily to, to last five years. And if we look at, uh, where's Andy? Um, SolidFire have just given us um, uh, a guarantee that they'll replace Flash for the lifetime of the device. Is that right, Andy? Is that, is that the guarantee? Um, so people like SolidFire are obviously happy that the testing they've done on their Flash devices means you know, they can co confidently give, for the lifetime of a device, free replacements. 
So I, it, it potentially isn't as much of a problem, but it has to evolve, and we'll talk about that, slide, that in the slide in another moment. Oh, and funny enough, here's that slide. Uh, I thought it was further on, actually. So just to... Um, so that's my timer to tell me to get off. There you go. Um, so just to touch on, on, on what you say, Martin, um, pretty much we started off with SLC, so um, very, the very much more expensive flash. We've moved to MLC, and everybody's now talking about TLC. And these are just um, generations of flash that can store, store more and more data in a single cell. Um, TLC is nowhere near as resilient as MLC, which was not as resilient as SLC. So potentially, as we go forward, and we move into 3D NAND and using TLC, that flash might not be as resilient and might not last as long. But again, the vendors have done a great job so far. So who's to say that they won't just do the same thing again and make those products last? So I think, yes, there is a lifetime issue, especially with TLC. But I think the vendors will do things to overcome it. So um, approaches, who's taking what? And I always like to get my picture of the Homer in there somewhere. And if, uh, if you don't know what that is, that is the car that Homer de um, developed for his brother who actually ran a car company and he bankrupted his brother's car company because he built a car that had absolutely every single feature on it. Um, and perhaps that's not the right way to divide, de de decide, sorry, design a storage array. So we talked about Flash. Flash is the first one. Everybody's doing Flash. Lots of vendors out there. Caminaro, Solid Fire, even the traditional vendors like um, HP are putting the Flash into their products and, and flashizing them. Um, <coughs> Other vendors are buying companies up, like EMC, um, and the flash is everywhere. And it's obviously very popular because it's very high performance, but cost might not be as um, effective as traditional um, arrays. But vendors are getting around that by quoting things like effective capacity and cheating by basically including dedupe and compression in their, in their calculations. And at the end of the day, despite what they say, it is cheating because you have no idea, unless you've actually measured your environment before you move your data on, what level of compression and DGP you're going to get. So your results will vary. So, and you've just got to take that in, into consideration. Um, we've got vendors who are doing hybrid products. So um, there's a gap between um, today's HDD um, traditional arrays, the legacy ones, and all flash, where we don't necessarily need that full performance, and a hybrid device may work. So hybrids fit that gap, and they're, they're probably more price conscious and better value. And, and it's, a, it's a good sort of stepping stone as we get to, to the, um, the all-flash data center. They still have issues, of course, because some data has to be stored on disk. So you are going to get a, a scenario occasionally where, especially with reads, you'll get disk performance. Scale out. And um, I've already mentioned uh, uh, SolidFi, but SolidFi are a great example of a company who are doing a scale out solution. Um, basically based on nodes where you deploy lots and lots of nodes and each node just builds into the, into the cluster and expands the capacity and the performance. The good thing about those is when you do your upgrade or want to take the, the old boxes out, you just evacuate them, you, de you, de um, you unconfigure them, you take them away. There's none of this big migration stuff that we used to have to do, which is, a, which is fantastic. 3 power are trying to call their stuff um, scale out as well, as would Extreme IO, but they're not quite the things. That, they're not quite scale out in the same way. They, they do call them stick scale out, Martin. And theoretically, they do scale, and you can add lots of nodes to it, but they forget to tell you that those nodes are closely coupled, and if you had lost one, your whole system would be down. So not quite as, as scale out as you might think. Uh, object stores, and we've got Cloudian presenting, I think, this afternoon. I'm not sure who's presenting on behalf of them. Are you doing that, Neil? Yeah. You're doing it? So they're, they're um, a cloud company, um, object stores are becoming much more interesting. And obviously, from a resiliency perspective, they, they use technologies like erasure coding, which give us the ability to scale to much larger volumes without being dependent on things like RAID. So they're, they're very interesting in terms of the, the ability to store lots of data. But of course, a lot of them have um, API front ends, REST API front ends, and don't have traditional protocols unless that's integrated into the package. And that can be an issue for people to work out how to program them. Um, we, we touched on these earlier, the data aware um, vendors. There are lots of people out there trying to actually do something with the data itself and understand the data a lot more. You've got companies like Tintree, uh, Primary Data, Data Gravity. These are quite new technologies, um, so there's still some evolution on those, and you know, they, they'll be very interesting, and they may be where everybody gets to eventually with a, as a feature. Everybody might just put this into their, their, their software. Um, 
But I'm not sure, you know, th I think that's one to watch as a, as a category. And then finally, software defined. And this is a really interesting one where basically you can go out and buy the software, you put it on your own hardware, and then, you know, you can, you can do that for, for a number of reasons, one of which could be you already buy using a certain technology and you don't want to put other things in the data center. You can just buy the hardware that from the same source that you always do at that cheaper rate and you layer the software over the top. And there's a lot of startups coming out that are hitting this area, as well as obviously some of the established people like VMware with vSAN. So, <clears throat> I think I've only got two slides left. What about cloud? Well, cloud is coming along and affecting this and it does have an impact. People can move data into the cloud much more than, quickly than they ever could. So you've got company like, companies like Avirst or Simple, Twin Strata, that are helping people migrate data into the cloud. Basically, excuse me, most of the time as a backup scenario. But you've also got the big guys like Google, Microsoft, and AWS, who are making it even more easy to get their data into the cloud, your data into the cloud, and then allow you to do stuff with it when it's in there. So you could, you could migrate that data up, and then you could start doing things like transcoding. You could do um, you know, um, virus checking. Now, th those are very simple things, but in the future, you can imagine we could get very much more complex with those features that we're putting stuff into the cloud. And it may well be that primary storage doesn't grow as much on the, in the data center, and if you're able to put your data in the cloud, the majority of it might just filter up and be stored elsewhere, especially as prices continue to drop. So that was a bit of a, of a whiz through things very, very quickly. This is the last slide. Um, how do we put that all together? What do, we, you know, what do we think about going forward in the future? But we still need to start with requirements. We still need to know what we actually want to do. And we need to actually think about what, what it is we're looking to achieve. So really need proper requirements. And we need to focus those on our sensitivities. So what are you trying to fix? Is it a cost problem? Is it a performance problem? Whatever it happens to be. Um, we should definitely see things in a bigger picture. Storage people, just like network people, have been very focused on their own technology without understanding the requirements of the application or the, um, the virtualization layer and so on. We shouldn't, we shouldn't just look at it in isolation. And we shouldn't buy a technology because we want the technology. We shouldn't buy it because we want the shiny box. You hear people say, I'm getting a flash device, and you think, well, why was it flash? Why did you need flash? Because somebody wanted a nice flash box to play with. Obviously, that's why. Um, and you shouldn't do that. Um, you should certainly look at evaluating your options. How are you, what is the technique you're going to do to go out and look at these devices and evaluate them? Tools like Load Dynamics are a great example of how you could do that. And obviously, use online resources and, and things like Twitter and use the wisdom of the crowd and events like this to actually help you formulate some sort of idea about what's going on. Because if you go out and look on Twitter and various other different social media, you'll get a fairly good idea of what people think about companies. Um, you might have to take that with a a pinch of salt because clearly some have got more marketing budget than others and like to talk a lot more. But even so, you know, certainly with bloggers and, and blogs, it's, there's a lot of information out there to help you. Um, and with that, and that was really quick, um, do we have any questions? Not a question. Well, oh, no, hold on, got one there. I'll come back to you in a second. Um, so you talk uh, about software-defined storage a lot, and it's going to be a trend in the future. I was thinking, do you believe that people really understand what hardware agnostic means, and the fact that the hardware actually matters in the end? It's you cannot just use anything. That is a really good question. So let's split that into two parts. I think people possibly don't quite understand what software defined means and the idea of the fact that the hardware still matters. And I think that's still something that people need to evolve into. However, I would point out companies like Springpath, who are a new company to the market, um, and they've, they've been very careful to abstract all of the physical entities that they, put it, that they would put their software onto so that when you actually build it and you put in, say, whatever, disk type or whatever, all of, the, all of that stuff is abstracted away, so you're, still, you're not dependent on what that particular hardware is. Although you still need that hardware to have a certain level of performance and functionality, you don't have to be tied to a, like a, a thing that is a disk drive, for instance. Um, and I think that's where we'll see software defined being really interesting when we obviously still need the, the features of the hardware and the capabilities, but we abstract it away far enough to not care about what specific device we put in there. So if we, if we put in a, a solid state disk in replacement of an HDD, all we get is, a, is more performance. But we don't have to deal with the characteristics of it. 
So, but you're right, I think people aren't quite aware of exactly what that means yet, and there's still a way to go. And there's no clear definition. I said that at the very bottom there. There's no definition of what software-defined means, so everybody will claim <laughs> software-defined, even if they're not. So you ought to... Sorry? Still there is an ATL for also string files, so... Yes. So, yeah, yeah, you're right, Aaron. I think part of that is the fact that um, you get vendors who have got products that don't quite do what they, th what they say they'll do. The classic one being VMware with vSAN and the, the RAID controller that didn't deliver the performance that everybody expected. But that's always going to be the case, isn't it? There's always going to be that issue. Um, and we're never going to be able to put anything on anything, potentially. There's always going to have to be some HDL, even if it's quite wide, widespread, but there'll still be one there. There's another question down here, Enrico, I think. Um, you talked about sort of quads as being one of your features that are required on storage arrays. And I agree with that completely. We see more and more people want guaranteed levels of service from yep. the storage. But the big issue that we tend to see a lot is that when you have virtualized sort of uh, guests infrastructure behind it, there's no correlation there between those guests and their use of the storage to the storage array. Mm -hmm. It only sees the hypervisor, not the guests. Yep. Are so you any way of sort of any discussions or on you know, coming technologies that will start, I guess, tagging the IOs so you can tag the guests with a storage IO so, so you know which guest is actually Are you Are you aware of Vivol technology from VMware or not? Um, Do you know that? Heard about it, not really. So the idea of Vivols is to abstract the virtual machine away from the physical data store that you would normally put the data on. So where, whereas today you would build a learn put a data store over the top of it, and that data store would be one big LUN with lots of virtual machines in, and as you said, the I.O. is just impossible to, to spot yep. from each, each VM. A VVOL is effectively a packaging of a virtual machine as a logical entity, and you can apply policies against that VVOL, and effectively you're applying it against that virtual machine. So that was announced with vSphere 6. Um, there's very, I think there's only about four vendors who have actually got real support for VVOLs in their products so far today. Um, good example, 3PAR have got that in their product. Um, and <laughs> is that right? Okay, thank you. I didn't think it was actually... So NetApp is another one. Thank you for the, uh, the, uh, the shameless plug from Alex at the back of the room. <laughs> that is true. I d yeah, that is true. <laughs> but the trouble is with that, I mean, Vivo is very much a proprietary solution from one hypervisor. You know, is there any sort of industry standard where... Well, that is the industry standard for... For VMware, but as you said, there isn't there is there, there, is, there is there isn't a standard for Hyper-V that I'm aware of that's come out yet. Yeah. Um, there are. Is there? Okay. So that but that hasn't been ratified yet, has it? Okay. Then I did put on Grid Store on there. Um, they've got technology that works on Hyper-V, which does do that lev that VM level mm. quality of service, but obviously that's proprietary to them. That's yeah. their technology. And that's the thing. There seems to be so much proprietary in there that that then will restrict your buying choices. Yeah, uh, I agree. And really, yep. you, know, you, you are tied into those vendors and those technologies there. And, it, and it's probably something we could whiteboard or talk about afterwards, but it, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff around that about how you, how you deal with those sort of that level of performance, and I think that's really still quite an important issue for people. It's a good one to raise. Any more questions? Oh, yep, got another one at the back there, Enrico. Um, what's, what, have you got any advice for the best way to buy, to not buy based on technology? If I need to get some more storage, how do you, because all the storage vendors are selling you technology uh, rather than selling you solutions. So, yeah, that is a, that we, we could spend about, an, I guess, the rest of the afternoon talking about that, if you like. But at a high level, what I'd say is it comes back to that requirements thing. So you need to give the vendor a list of your requirements in an abstracted way that doesn't specifically refer to the hardware. So you shouldn't give something to them that says, I want three boxes, I want 15K drives in it, or whatever. You need to break it down into um, something where you've got a service catalog. So you say you've, you know, you've actually got... T let's call it tier one, two, and three type technology, but you set a specification around what that technology is in terms of performance, in terms of re resilience and availability, and you should just give that to them, very abstract, and let them come back with a solution. The only problem you have there, of course, is that 
they will try and cheat slightly. So um, you might find that they deliberately underpower it in terms of things like back-end directors and controllers in order to get the price down. So you really do need somebody who can look at that quote and then say, hold on a second, you know, that's, that's, gonna, you know, that's, a, that's a cheat. You can't get away with doing that because you'll never be able to expand that in the future without a big cost. So I would abstract it, but uh, you, know, you still need, I guess, to a certain degree, professional advice. It's a tricky one. Um, you mentioned that uh, some all-flash vendors have to cheat by adding dedupe and the like. Yeah. Um, do you see, do you, have you seen um, the overhead of that dedupe actually be a, a detriment compared to yes. a more traditional array hybrid or okay. otherwise that, that doesn't employ not, not to Not to a more traditional array necessarily, but if you look at dedupe turned on and turned off within a particular flash product, you will see a big difference in the response time, in the latency. Yeah. Significant. Yes. Um, the only person, or the only vendor I've seen quote that recently was Violin, and they actually now start showing you the difference between the two on their systems. Um, and I think that's, that's quite good transparent information because you at least can make a decision about whether you're trading off the value of the dedupe against the value of the performance, and you can decide to have one or the other. Sadly, some vendors don't let you turn it off at all, and therefore, yeah. you know, it is what it is. Um, yeah, no, we've, we've seen that on our yeah. PAC, compar comparing yeah. an all-flash array and a hybrid array, and the hybrid array won out on our workload. Right, okay. So due, due, to, due to latency. Due to latency, okay, that's interesting. Sorry, Hans, go on. Uh, but due to flash, we have the option, which we didn't before. We can choose to do that in, in line or not, which we couldn't do before because we did not have the performance of flash. Um, yes, and, and all the other components, I'd say, as well, you know. Um, we didn't have the multi-core processors, we didn't have the volume of memory we can cram into boxes, not without the cost. Yeah. 